long have you been back from overseas? Oh, well, just a couple of weeks. Much obliged, Miss Triple Banks. You give yourself a wonderful day. Take care. It's all right. It's just a car. It must have backfired. They say it stops eventually. You just come back. Come all the way back. My nightmare is always the same. I scream. But it's nothing coming now. This place, this law, we don't belong to them. I am so thrilled uh, that we have joining us today the director and co-writer of the film, D. Rees. Uh, next is uh, the um, dialogue and music mixer, Rob Fernandez. Uh, sound designer and effects mixer, Damian Volpe. The amazing composer, Tom McCauley. Uh, music editor, Nancy Allen. and Dialogue Supervisor Tony Martinez. So I, I thought it would be useful before we actually kind of dive into the discussion about the, the clips. Um, uh, obviously we, we know what the, the director does, but I thought it'd be great if you guys can just, we can go down and just uh, introduce yourselves and just, you know, 15, 20 seconds about what your job on the film is and, and constructing the track. Yeah, all right. So uh, my name is Rob Fernandez, and I am the dialogue music mixer of the movie. And as the name suggests, I balance the music against the dialogue. And even though Damien and I have worked together for many years, we pretty much work together as a team, and we go over uh, each other's boundaries a bit. So <laughs> anyway, so that's what I do. You're going to find out that this is actually a pretty tightly woven team. Uh, they've, they've actually worked together, for, actually for you, on your previous film, Bessie, and a couple of you guys came from um, Dee's first film, uh, Pariah. So this is, uh, we've been having a good time because they're a pretty tight team. My name is Damian Volpe, I'm the sound supervisor. I just want to start by saying Rob is being a little modest. He's what we call a lead mixer, it means he's in charge of the mix. Uh, well, of course, Dee's in charge of the mix, but <laughs> after that, Rob's in charge. Um, and uh, so I mix alongside Rob, and uh, generally speaking, I mix the effects only in backgrounds, and then I have to keep an ear for the overall level soundscape, um, just, you know, sit back and, and watch and try to listen to the balance of music, effects, and dialogue, which are the three main components. I also assemble the team of editors and uh, deal with the schedule and budget and, you know, make sure everything is as Dee would like it, hopefully. That's the plan. I'm Tamar Kali, and um, in, <laughs> in scoring the film, in addition to um, underscoring the events of the film with music, um, for this um, project, I also was in charge of um, organizing the ensemble, picking the musicians, you know, and um, orchestrating uh, the music and conducting as well for the recording session. And, and she also sang Bill Bailey in the film. <laughs> um, my name is Nancy Allen. I'm the music editor. Uh, that that role changes from film to film on this particular film. I worked right between Dee and Tamar. And Tamar. Um, this was Tamar's first time scoring a feature film but her musical, musical grasp of the story and her impulses for the storytelling were so spot on and so in sync with Dee that much of my job was staying out of her way. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the very specific logistics of how to produce a score for film 
um, you know, in terms of conducting it to picture? Uh, how does Tamar work with her producer and engineer to deliver the material to me in such a way that we have the most flexibility on the mix stage? Those were things that I was very involved with on this process, which is sometimes not the case when I'm working with a composer who has a, a whole team who have done 600 films already. I just, you know. But in this particular context, it was very much a role that was supportive of Tamar. She had her tone. She had the themes all mapped out in her mind. It was, it was, um, that was it. <laughs> My name's uh, Tony Martinez. I supervise the dialogue and ADR <clears throat> for the film, which me which really uh, means that I, I prepare the dialogue and clean it up out of, you know, any extraneous noises or offensive sounds, smooth out the transitions, and prepare the tracks as um, elegantly as I possibly can for Rob to do his job and mix them. Uh, and additionally, uh, as the ADR supervisor, I queued up any dialogue that needed to be replaced for technical reasons or because of dialogue changes um, and any of the background uh, voices that you hear uh, also were queued by me and we re recorded and cut by me and prepped for, again, for Rob. Awesome. Yeah, good round of applause for this. So let's talk about this opening sequence. Um, so D, uh, the, the great the great sound designer uh, Ben Burt uh, will sometimes talk about, or he's often talked about the what he calls the magic of the first ten minutes of the movie, and the kind of the you know the audience shows up to your film with a great amount of goodwill and eager anticipation for what they're what they're going to see, and you have a as a storyteller you have a fantastic opportunity in that first ten minutes. But you're also doing a lot of very specific work. You're you're setting the tone. You're kind of establishing the cinematic language of how you're going to tell this particular story. So I, I would love to hear from you about how you designed this opening sequence, um, why you decided to start the story at this particular point, um, and and also how you approached the sound and the music for this opening sequence. Totally. So I also um, want to shout out Michael Clements, you know, who's our editor, is here. <laughs> And so a lot of the reason why the story starts here is because Mako, you know, you know, we, you know, there's a script, but then you like vary, you know, and so we played with it and we, you know, we started to try to do like a Rashomon kind of structure because there's six characters, there's six narrators and all these different points of view. We really wanted you to place, you know, you subjectively with each character. And so in terms of my approach to shooting, I really wanted to shoot this like a Western. So the opening is this kind of like badass Western, you know, landscapes and standoffs and like, lean, you know, like diagonals and leaning bodies, and so the opening of the film kind of puts you in that mode of, like, Jamie smoking and, like, the levels, like the high and the low and someone standing over someone. So, um, you know, I just, I was, like, opening movies with, like, spectacle, like, with a bang, like, if you saw Pariah, like, I'd like to open, you know, with, like, something shocking. And, um, you know, this, like, drowning scene, which was part of the script that Virgil Williams wrote, and, you know, it was an amazing opening, it's like, you know, symbolically is great because we're starting with burial and we're starting in a slave's grave and you know the characters are either are, are you know either going to bury their past or like deal with their past and so it's just like a great brooding way to just kind of like dolly in and then we get to like these extreme kind of high high and low angles and just to put us in jamie's mindset like the peril of it and also the thing i'm trying to do in the first five minutes is you know establish these two brothers you know and so in digging this hole we get the relationship between this older brother and younger brother and you know that there's a secret there and then bam we smash to the title card so yeah um i'd love for you and tom or Colin to talk a little bit about the music choices in this first sequence and 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 how you actually kind of approach the music like even from a basic level of how did you decide what the instrumentation was going to be and sort of what the you know, there's human voices in this as well obviously so how did you decide what the you know what the the tools the pieces that you were going to use um for the music well d has very strong vision so um you're starting from a place where you have a lot of really great motivation and direction um we went through like a, a list of adjectives that would set the mood um falling um uh, attempting over and over cycle but not me um the ancestors like yeah. you could just say stuff like that or like sludgy and then tomorrow's like oh that's two violas and a violin and, a <laughs> <laughs> and you also were very but you were also very clear that you did want like string vibration like you know she wanted a small string ensemble nothing no, piano. really huge yeah and i did play with some piano at first but that was not what she was hearing or what she feel it felt or needed and so we took that out but um 
really for me it was just about letting the the scenes tell me what were going on. I also read the book as soon as we talked about doing this project. I read the book. Like I'm one of those very immersive type. Like I go in super super hard. It might be post 13 years of Catholic school. Like I'm just like really intense. But so that that definitely helped knowing the material already and where the story was going, and then all the the work we did around trying to construct what the feeling is and what she was going for. And then the thing I love about Tamara also is that she's able to use voice as instrument, you know, and so like the voice becomes her string and just the way she can manipulate that and it's just amazing. Like I love that I can just speak in adjectives, you know, and she has a musical language. Like she translates that to half notes and quarter notes and like I wouldn't be able to articulate, but you know, we just really connected on like the material and the feeling of it and like she would send me samples and like garage band and like, yeah, that's it, you know, and so like garage band is like the blunt is told, but Tamara is able to make it, make it specific, and like really, tr really communicate what she's going to do with it. And so I just trusted her totally. And also because the um, just her rich understanding of where she wants things to happen. So I might create something. For instance, the humming. I had created that specifically for the the Jackson family intro, but then D said, you know, I really dig this, but I want to hear it as part of you know the light motif that I created for my band, the theme you hear secondarily, but she wanted to hear that. And it, and it worked brilliant together. So there was a lot of back and forth and playing off of each other. So uh, for the handful of you guys who haven't seen the film, it's basically the story of about two brothers set in Mississippi in the late uh, mid 1940s uh, after World War II, and one of the brothers who fought in World War II comes back. Uh, and then it's, um, it's a kind of a drama between two families on this farm. Uh, in, in in Mississippi, um, and uh, I'm really curious. You know, one of the things that I immediately noticed when I first saw the rough cut of the film, when we were when we were looking at it, was your use of narration and, and the multiple voiceovers. Was that always part of the design for you uh, for the film, or had it, that's a very strong decision? Obviously, how did that come about? Yeah, that was a part of the original script, and then when I came on and developed the script, I, I wanted to like really make sure like all the voices were equal, you know, like it wasn't any one person's story, you know, it was all of their stories, which is like hard to do and like risky because then it ends up being like no one's story if it's not done well. So I really wanted to like bring all six voices in and like, you know, Florence, for example, voice of her is key because she's very internal. Like she doesn't say what she thinks, like she only talks to her family, you know, and Laura, you know, is, you know, in a social construct where, you know, she can't say what she really thinks to Henry or direct him because, you know, he needs to be in charge. And so voiceover became important because, especially for some of the women, because it's the things that they couldn't say and it's a way into their mindset. And um, Jamie, you know, is an interesting narrator because he's he's actually like one of the truthful like narrators. And so all that was 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 very important. And I, I use monologues, like new monologues, to give Hap backstory. So he has this kind of musing about you know the land and what does it mean to invest in land but never be vested, you know, to never have ownership. And the same thing for um, Florence when she's going to care for these kids, you know, this meditation on her mother, you know, because like all this is happening behind her eyes and you couldn't know it. So voiceover is necessary to really give them like this core. And so when they smile or look happy to see someone inside, you know, we know that they're actually dreading this interaction or this is like actually a dangerous place for them. And that was a good way to kind of juxtapose like the inner and outer worlds. No, I just wanted to add, and the great thing about the voiceovers is that they were a lot of them were recorded on on the set, so the the characters were they were still in character. Ordinarily, voiceovers recorded after the fact, months maybe even after the film has been shot. So it added a nice authenticity to the voiceovers, and and and, and it also the environment kind of worked its way into their performances in a kind of a beautiful, evocative way. So that was a, that was a brilliant choice. Yeah, and, and thankfully, Tony let me keep all that. Cause, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, typically it's, it's, it's like dirty sound because it's like, you know, they're like, you know, in the wind and breeze. But luckily, Tony like did his magic and made it work. So I heard a rumor that some of the ADR on this film was recorded on iPhones. Yeah, <laughs> well, like Rob Morgan, like so this like I was like writing stuff after the fact. And so I like wanted this like meditation on land. And so I wrote the stuff for Rob. I was like, just just record it and send it to me, and we'll re-record it. But it was so good, and Rob has such a um, tender to his voice. It's very gravelly and it's interesting. Like his his voice has texture, and like I loved it. And even like the distortions were interesting. And it's like Tony, please, can we keep it? You know, and you know they made it work. Yeah, so it's great. And with Mary J. Blige too, I like had written some stuff for her after the fact, and it was just like just just do it on your phone and send it. You know, and we'll try to use it because I don't know. There's just like a different feeling in it. You know? 
Well, we've been talking a little bit about this about this uh, this topic um, as we've kind of gone through this process, and, and um, there's um, a, 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 your your sound and music team are very aware that that you don't like things too pristine and too clean, um, and, and and it kind of just really echoes the theme of the film, Mudbound. You know, it's Mudbound. So, yeah, and so what 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 was interesting for me is like even in this scene that we just saw with the rain and, and Jamie's down in the pit, you know, they're yelling at each other, and I'm not necessarily understanding everything that they're saying. Um, and for, for you know, other directors might like you know we need to clean that up, but that wasn't your approach. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I just like it to feel like, you know, immersive and like you're there and like when you're yelling, you don't hear everything, but you get the, the intonation of it. And even like in terms of like a dialect standpoint, you know, like these are Southerners, like I don't want to hear any R's or T's, you know, like it's like, you know, like let them round off. And so I, I will, I'm, I'm interested in making the audience kind of like really listen and lean in and it really gives specificity to these characters' voices. Like only Jamie sounds like Jamie, Hap sounds like Hap, and when you're listening to Hap, you just train your ears to learn how to hear him. You know, when you're listening to like Laura, you train your ears to learn to learn how to hear her. And so I think it's important it just makes it feel more honest and just like more more lifelike because when you're in conversation with people you miss stuff and you don't hear stuff and like what'd you say and misunderstanding and communication and connection is all kind of what the film's about. Not only that, but in that sequence you actually place the thunder to interfere with the lines. Yeah. <laughs> So there's misunderstanding. So Jamie's like, oh, does my right. brother know that I've done this thing and he's going to get me? And so this, the, the miscommunication, I think. Right, because Jamie's afraid that he's being left down there yeah. to drown. Right, so he doesn't hear him telling him, I'm going to go get a ladder. Yeah. He doesn't hear him. Yeah, the, and, yeah, does the audience. Yeah. Because the words aren't all, always very clear, uh, the sound becomes sort of, a, the voice becomes a, a sound design element. It's the sound of, sound of their voices kind of fits into the fabric. I mean, it's, the specific words aren't necessarily that important. The overall feel is important. So from a sound design perspective, this is really, this is pretty interesting, fun, cool stuff. And I'm kind of curious, you went to, you went to, you studied film at NYU. So was there part of the curriculum that was about sound? Where did you learn how to do this, is my question to you. Was that part of the, you know, what was the sound curriculum like at NYU? Where did you pick this stuff up? It was old, like we had DATs, so <laughs> but they would send us in the field with our little DAT machines. So, so they taught sound recording. And a wonderful professor who's passed away, but he taught us like sound recording. And so we learned how to record sound, but sound design wasn't a class. But you know, it was just the kind of idea of like, the sound is narrative. Like it's like that's what was learned, like sound is just as narrative as the picture, you know? And so if the picture's telling you one thing and the sound is telling you another, you don't believe it. And the audience like, you don't know why you don't believe it or you don't know why something is, seems fake. But a lot of times it's because the sound, you know, seems artificial or doesn't match what you're seeing. And so your eyes and your ears are processing at different rates. And so, yeah, so I know they don't put on dads anymore, but so I'm, I'm like lost now. With sound <laughs> Didn't you attend Tony's class? <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. I, Charles, uh, Charles Blackwell. Charles Blackwell, the, uh, yeah. But yeah, Steve was, was, was a former student of mine. No. But if, if, was that true? Yeah, yeah. 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 And if you go back to Pariah, you can see, you know, it struck me the first time I met Dean, and I hadn't seen Pariah, so I went home right away to watch it, so I do my homework. And the sound in that film is, is really interesting and very subjective, it's very bold. And, you know, I knew right away this is a director who, who's got some, some very uh, strong ideas, interesting ideas, he's very brave, doesn't want to walk the straight line. And, um, you know, I, I urge you all to check it out if you haven't seen that. That's a, it's a great starting point for Dean's work, and uh, just got better from there, I think, so. Cool. Well, let's, um, why don't we take a look at the second clip? So this is, um, this is country violence. Would you set us up a little bit? So the, visually and, like, narratively, I was going for, like, just the everyday brutality, like, the matter of factness, things get sick, things die, things rot, this happens every day, and, you know, I was thinking something very, like, sludgy. And then Tamar did this like counter thing where it's it like just upbeat. Yeah. It's like everything dies, everything gets sick. And it was like it was like, cool. And it's like, oh my god, that's working. Well, from my perspective, it was like a tango of death. Yeah. You know, yeah. where it's like you know, and that's why I had a little theme that was tango esque in there. It's this cycle. Keep going. This is. Good. <laughs> so Nancy, can you talk a little bit about about you know how you handle these tracks and how you prepare the stuff for the stage and and and. There's also source music uh, in, in the film, which which you're heavily involved with. Yes. Uh, so for the score, and just keep spilling too many beans. Uh, we had a very small ensemble, and we had a very short period of time in which to record the score. 
It was a trial by fire. Yeah. <laughs> and we had 40 minutes of score. Two days. So in theory, that's 20 minutes a day. But because it was a very small ensemble, there was always the plan that we would be recording sections of it. The musicians would record over themselves so that we would have layers. And they were a very, very talented group of musicians so that they were going to be able to do, you know, there were going to be some really cool colors. Um, Additionally, as Dee mentioned, the, the demos were created in GarageBand, so when you hear live, live musicians perform these things, there's no, so we had, we had a little play time, we had some overdubs, we were, I mean, it was a super, super, super tight schedule. There was no isolation in the studio. It's a studio that doesn't do a lot of uh, recording to picture. Um, everything about it was, from a traditional film scoring standpoint, it was very unorthodox, but you know, we were going to make it work. There was no way that I wanted to impose a process onto Tamar just because that's the way the film scores are recorded. Tamar's incredibly talented producer and engineer, Victor Axelrod, who I want to shout out every chance I can because he's got exquisite sensibilities. He's such a smart guy. Um, we recorded this in a very straight up old school analog studio. And um, it, everything was done in stereo. Uh, he mixed everything analog. So as Rob and I were reminding ourselves this morning, I mean, this was not like Victor could go back and recall a mix. We, this was our mix. So Victor and I and Tamar tried to plan as much as we could how we would prepare the cues, what kind of separation were we going to have. We had one bass, so if there were two bass parts, we knew we were going to have separation there, but would we record the bass in an overdub session so it would be completely clean? Do you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. We didn't have a lot of time to do the math. At, at some point, we just had to start recording. Composition was still happening like up until the recording. Yeah, composition and parts preparation. So at one point, you know, we had, we had our dream order of how to record the score cues based on based on food groups in terms of themes and based on you know size so that you know as we got to the second day we wouldn't have to pay for a full ensemble if we didn't have to because again budgetary restraints but that quickly went out the window and it was it wasn't triage but it was like full-on get it done mode i mean i was in major border calling mode and um victor and i beforehand were very very um we went really deep in a couple of conversations. I, I, like I said, he hadn't done this before. So the world of preparing material for a 5-1, let alone an Atmos environment or a 7-1 environment, was completely new to him. Um, very quickly in that initial conversation, we discovered we had one of the greatest things that we could ever hope for because of the studio where we recorded in, and it was an old school plate reverb that was just, by itself in a closet down the hall. So I was gonna have this amazing, gorgeous plate reverb all on its own, no matter what we recorded. And that was one of the first things that Rob and Damien and I talked about as an element that was gonna be available to us on this stage. The conversation pretty much went like, okay, it's a really small ensemble, we have absolutely no separation, but I'm gonna be able to give you a really great plate reverb. So And that, when, that was part of the Atmos conversation. That was part of the Atmos conversation because we figured that that would be a fantastic element to, to play with in the Atmos environment, specifically, mostly, but then we ended up using it to color everything. Um, and then Victor and I, uh, when we were mixing down these cues, because of the way he set everything up to record, he did as much as he could to get isolation where he could given the fact that we had no ISO booths, so we had spot mics. And when we would do a second orchestral pass, we would have that separate. So we would kind of make a little game plan for each cue that had been recorded. And okay, here's a melodic component that's really, really crucial. And it's part of the orchestra A, but we have the spot mics. So he would pull as much of that out as possible and give that to me on a stem, even though it wasn't completely on its own. It was enough to give Rob some control and flexibility. And then obviously whatever we did as an overdub, we tried to keep that separate. Um, so it was a lot of sort of, you know, logistics and food groups and, you know, 
P and, and, and P you know, puzzle pieces that we were constantly figuring out. But it was, it was a very, very organic process because of the way Tamar works, because of the way that she thinks, because of the way that she wrote the score. You know, the thematic connections are incredibly strong. And when we hit, you know, the, the second act, there is a whole new shift in tone. And, um, you know, that's all organic to her compositional instincts. So, like I said, this was where I was just staying out of the way. I was just, you know, I just had an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> so, D, um, I think one of the things that, that especially, you know, young first time directors uh, sometimes struggle with is how do they communicate with their sound um, design and music teams? So, I'm kind of curious about what your, your approach is. At what point, you know, with Damien and Rob, at what point do you start having conversations with them about what you want to do from a sound design perspective uh, with Tom or Kali, like what time, you know, at what point in the process do you start those conversations and, and how do you actually kind of, what's the process that you go with uh, uh, with them? Do you sit down and watch the film and, and, and what kind of language do you use to talk to them about what you want to have in the track? So like if I were talking to a first time filmmaker, I would kind of advise them to just kind of like speak normally, speak in adjectives, you know, and just like spot the film. So I spotted the film with Tamar, she came, she drove up to Kingston because we're editing in this little funky little space. And just like watch the film and say nothing and just kind of like trust your team as artists because they're artists too. And like, just like you don't want anybody over your shoulder telling you where to paint, like try to like, you know, just let them have the first pass. And so. But tomorrow we spotted it and the sound team like I don't know if you guys like saw it separately or did we spot it together? We spotted it together. Yeah, we spotted it, yeah. So it's just kinda like just watching the film together, like impressions and like where things are important, like, oh this thing that's dirty or seems like a mistake, like leave that. And so like the guide track of the edit like informs, you know, like the initial pass, like, oh, this is where we're going with this, or this is what we're trying to do, you know. And so I think it's like a just a spotting session speak, you know. You know, you don't have to use the language of sound necessarily if that's not your expertise. Like, let them have their expertise and just kind of communicate the feeling. Like, I want it to feel tense. I want it to feel, you know, not as literal. You know, and so just kind of speak that way, and they can kind of translate that and you know, do whatever. Can I? Can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Can, sure. I mean, you and I had this experience on Bessie um, when we were talking about the music because it was a very different score than what you were anticipating, and. Um, you had a very specific color in mind and that's what you wanted to go for and you were trying to um, express that. And then very quickly we went over to that place where I tried to get you to start talking about the emotion of the scene. And I would say, as um, filmmakers, music is a, t is a place where a lot of directors get very, very uncomfortable because you're involved in every part of the process, pre-production, production, every part of it, and then all of a sudden somebody comes in and they go off and two weeks later they come and they have this thing that is a factual musical representation of your story. And it flips a lot of directors out and it's a completely leg legitimate reaction. But, I, you know, the thing that's really, really important is don't ever feel like you can't have a conversation with your director, I mean your composer, because you don't, a lot of directors feel like they have to speak in musical terms. They have to be able to talk about instruments and they have to be able to talk about notation and they have to, it's the worst thing that, it's the worst kind of feedback that a composer can get. And that, a lot of times, is the biggest part of my job, deciphering that. I can, I'll sit there and, 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 and the director will go, I want percussion, I want percussion, I need, you know, and a composer hears percussion or drums, and they start going down a whole different path. What the director really wants is energy. So that's a huge part of my job, but that wasn't as much of a part of, because you and I already have that practice where you know to speak in emotion and adverbs. What do you want the viewer to be feeling? What do you want? And you know that that's what's most valuable to the team. I mean, I think it's similar, but also different with the sound design, where we started the conversation, because it, you know, a lot, in this clip is pretty interesting because a lot of the sound was already in place. Like Mako and Dee had built the, this section with some really interesting sounds in there that, uh, you know, those, they worked. There was no reason for me to replace them. Dee was, you know, I could see already what they were going for. Deep speaks sometimes the way Nancy's talking. You know, you'll get adjectives that are real eyebrow scratchers. Like, I want this to be blue. You know, well, I don't know what sound that is, but I'm going to try to make a blue sound. Is that is that true? Is it? Yeah. Well, yes. and Bessie was uh, 
think was the inner churn. I was like, okay. Churn, churn, churn. But then I don't sleep for a couple nights, and I think, what's the inner churn? I don't know what my inner churn sounds like. It is not what her inner churn sounds like. So um, this piece, though, you know, it was mostly in place, and I had the benefit, actually, of a great temp score already from Tamar, which is a rare treat for an independent sound designer. A lot of times I get, you know, the score on the stage, and I have to see how does my work collide, dance, box, you know, and get knocked down by the score. In this case, because I had it, um, it was a real blessing because I can see, okay, there's this dark, rich string section, so I can use the higher registers. And that way we stay out of each other's way. And Rob and I were talking this morning, all the whole team, um, you know, in the mix, Rob did something with the music in this section where it kind of begins in the front and, um, and then pulls back into the theater. And I had done something coincidentally that worked really nicely with that, where uh, the sound of the cleaning the shotgun, um, which I thought was just a beautiful sound. You know, I, I wanted to start that earlier and in a very, um, just vague way, you know, kind of drenched in reverb and you don't, you're not really aware of it and it starts all the way in the back of the theater and you probably don't feel it so much here. And then as it gets closer and closer to Laura, it gets drier and drier and then lands on her once that scene is done. And, and so that was a really nice, that gave the whole scene a real um, dynamic that I think it didn't have. And it's a dense sound design scene. You know, sometimes when we, we build a uh, soundtrack, we think in terms of um, disparity or density. You know, is it, are you just hearing one thing? Is it a collage of, of sounds that are a little disorienting? I think that first scene is the same way. You know, I wanted it to, to be very dynamic, to be super quiet and just, just feel these, the isolation of these characters. And then also to feel the threat of the environment that mirrored the threat of the hatred and the misogyny and bigotry that was the part of that environment. So, you know, it starts out very quiet with these guys digging this grave and then when the rain hits, it's, you know, it's, it's like warfare. I mean, it really is an assault. It's interesting hearing you describe that because what I would do sometimes after I composed a piece is just listen, sometimes in spaces where there was dialogue, to just how everything flowed together because for me, my job was to accompany what was happening. So they needed to kind of have this nice organic flow. So it was about the imagery, but it also was about what was being said, how it was being said. You know, all of those things worked together. The, like the, the grand, um, you know, composition was everything <laughs> together that you would hear. So we have one more clip to show, uh, which is One Morning Soon. Um, do you, what, what do you want to say about this before we watch it? So I like this because it's an example of like non-literal sound and like, you know, a lot of things we were doing are, you know, thematically we're juxtaposing the war at home and the war abroad. And so I like this sequence because it shows like, you know, this kind of embattledness and like it's non-literal and there's this like shift where it goes from like source to score. And so I just love being non-literal and like it was a hard cue to do because we had to make it look deliberate or you think, oh, this is just a bad sing-along. So then like how to make it sound different. So it's like, this is a deliberate choice. The people are singing the same song and the score is going to be that same song. It's a shift and you know, how to like make it all work. And then, yeah, so yeah, we'll see. Let's take a look at it. So Rob, you, you, you were telling a story about the, when you mixed this sequence, you, you, you had a, a really beautiful layer transition from right, half singing sure into the that. into the source you know, the source version uh, and, and, and D hadn't seen it uh, and and, 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 and D saw it and first. you got you got corrected <laughs> and, and when D got there I mean I should have known better and she was like oh my god you know that is a beautiful transition that's not what I want to do. <laughs> so um, so we actually then stepped back and still left somewhat of a transition He's like, no, 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 I want a hard transition. So it goes from them singing the church straight into the score. So there is no, you know, there's no mistake if this is on purpose, this is the way uh, that she wanted it done. And, but, but I think in terms of, I mean, you, your instinct was probably like, you've worked with a lot of directors. And that's sort of a more normal or I guess yes, typical I, I thought, way. I mean, to approach that kind of, I had heard the guy talk. I'm, I'm not trying to say that he is abnormal. But, <laughs> it's my work. Yeah. But, what, but I'm curious, for, so for you, why was it important to have that hard cut? What did that achieve for, for you from a narrative standpoint? 
So the score, so the, the the source, like the score you're hearing, is this guy called Dr. C.J. Johnson, and so he was like one of those old timey preachers where like it was no instrumentation, it was like this kind of like long meter singing where there's no hymnals, right? And so someone like sings a verse and everybody's kind of dragging on the verse because they're waiting for the next verse to be sung so they know like what what, what the words are and so I, I really wanted cj johnson's energy in this film and i don't know for me it just evoked like the energy of like ancestral spirit of like voices of angels and there's another part like where they where, where they first come in um so i just like that feeling of it and so it's it's meant to be these voices are beyond these people like these are the songs that the people have sung before them and before them just to make it feel ancient you know it's like a force rather than just like we're singing in church you know and like i like the imperfections and like you know rob the actor was really vulnerable and brave and going there because he's not a singer and i was like rob i know you're not a singer i want that like i want that you know i don't want this kind of smooth preacher and everybody's perfect you know and so narratively that just makes it feel more kind of urgent and these are people who are looking to hang on to something like they're looking for a reason to believe every week you know and there's not much reason and so the hard cuts and like the raggedness of it you know just feels like this kind of ragged faith this kind of worn hope and that they just kind of muster it up every sunday and um just carrying like the sounds of battle so like you know Ronzel is one who's in battle but his father's the one who gets injured and carrying like the sounds of bombs over rob you know like, i need a medic i need a medic you know and like it's the father on the ground so just really making the battle like span both men like, like both men father and son are kind of bonded in this way so so when we were looking at the films that sundance gave us to consider for the for the fellowship you know we all had a great reaction to, to mudbound and I, I think that you know it's really easy to point to the war sequences oh those are big sound design moments you know there's a lot you know bullets and things flying in it. but i think one of the things that we really responded to was the was the way you use the location and the environment in the farmlands of Mississippi. That this is a you know this building of the church is an ongoing thing through the film. Um, the the sharecropper shack that they that the family lives in is really it's to say it's not weather tight it would be an understatement, right? It's raining in the house. The wind is whipping through. And so I'm curious for for you know was that was a conscious decision and and for you as you're even thinking about production design. And, and it gave some wonderful opportunities for sound design. Yeah, just in terms of just like the narrative and visuals, you know, I've learned just from my own experience, like country life is about keeping the outside out and it's impossible. You know, your house is porous, literally it's porous, things are coming in and, and, and these guys like really play with that with sound design. Like, you know, there's always things around us. There's always things where they shouldn't be, you know, there are things, sounds aren't where they're supposed to be because that's country life, things are always creeping in, you know, so. He's like, where are those crickets coming from? What are the crickets? We've got a damn cricket. <laughs> uh, so for uh, Rob and Damien, so um, part of the fellowship was it allowed you guys to mix the film in Dolby Atmos, which is the, our object-based sound format. Um, and it was your first time working in, in Atmos. So what what were the things that you were you know, kind of excited to try out in the, in, in, the, in the format? Especially for, I think, you know, a lot of people think of, you know, w why is that useful for sort of a more quiet, subtle film like this. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, cause, because um, it allows you to play sounds anywhere in the room. It really creates a 3D space for you to play with. And uh, in that environment, uh, you can make things subtle but, but still have them be noticed. And, um, and you know, the level is not the only tool at your disposal. Just by placing them in the room, by moving things around, um, you can really then maintain that dynamic range between the environment and the voices. Uh, and, uh, it allowed us to have very quiet moments in the film and then really allow the loud parts of the film to really come to the and, um, and, and same for the music. We were, actually, we were able to make the music lower if you needed to by uh, by using the space to more efficiently. I'm, I'm curious about, you know, was your approach to mixing music in Atmos different from mixing in 5.1? Yes, it was, and I had to, you know, we had very little time again, so uh, so I had to take, a, it was a, a quick uh, learning experience, but, um, uh, you know, I'm usually mixing a film like this and mixing in a tight schedule, you usually try to grab a scene and grab the, try to get the, uh, the pacing of the scene and then try to grab the tempo of the music as you're going along and then to try to sort of like have a 
instinct for where to fade the music in the scene to allow the dialogue to come through. And uh, and very quickly I found out, wait a minute, I don't need to do this in Admos. In Admos, it allows you, it, since it gives you this much sonic space, I, it allowed me to, I don't need to fade the music. I can keep the energy the way it's going, which I think these are really going to like, and I think she did. And just make the space by moving things around the room. And, um, and, and we played around a lot with that a lot, and it allowed us to have, I think, a much more you know, dynamic mix because of that. Yeah, I, I would second all that. I mean, I think we, we found very quickly, uh, as we had to learn everything quickly, it was a crash course. But um, that the, the, one of the big things in Atmos uh, for this film, I think probably for all films, is that you actually have some speakers right off of the screen before you would normally get to the surround speakers in a normal 5-1 theater. And so that was tremendously useful because we could bring the music back just a little bit off the screen. It still felt the forward presence. You still felt it coming from the screen. You still felt it in front of you, but it made all this room for the dialogue and, and the sound effects, sound design as well. So that was huge. And then I, I was also surprised very pleasantly by the um, ways that we could subtly use Atmos. I, I thought, well, this is you know not um, Spider-Man Nine or whatever we're at at this point, you know. But there was a na it was very natural sounding to me. Uh, you know, I, I, once I started using it for backgrounds, um, I found that it actually sounded more like the world than we're used to hearing in a theater. So I think um, that it will become hopefully more prevalent. And that I know that our, 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 I think our brains very quickly attune themselves to new ways of hearing and seeing. And in this regard, I think the sound is actually a bit ahead of the picture. You know, the 3D picture is kind of fun, but it's, you're so aware of the artifice of it. And I think that Atmos, which is what I would say is an anal analogous sound technology, is, is, is way ahead of that. It's, it's a very naturalistic sound, and you can obviously use it very, um, you know, you can, you could use it in more in less subtle ways, clearly, but um, also in very nice subtle ways to help tell a story. Obviously, that's our goal. Ultimately, is that every sound and every note and every word is in service to the story. And I was impressed, you know, that when I came and hung out on the stage with a for you guys with a for a couple of days, you really got into it. You're, you're like you were having Rob explain to you like how does this what, what is this panner? How does this all what, what are the, all these balls on yeah, the, on the balls screen? on the screen? Like where are the balls going? Put the balls behind us. Like <laughs> more balls. More balls. So um, uh, just one more thing, but uh, one more question before we open up. One of the things that uh, I think is just a really wonderful sound design tool is you, you, you talk about porous, you use the word porous in terms of the buildings and the structure, but I also find like the sound design in the track is very porous. So you got, you know, you'll start to bring in elements from the next coming scene from a sound perspective previously into, and it's, you know, I mean, everybody does it, you know, sometimes a pre-lap, but you do, like, you actually take it quite a bit further, and a really extreme kind of... Extreme pre-laps. It, yeah, but in a really interesting way, so I was curious, was that part of your vision from the very beginning? Did that come out of the editorial process with Damien, or how did that happen? Yeah, like, Damien and I, so we, like, really vibed on Bessie, and, like, you know, like, my, my, like, I, I keep using the word, like, you know, non-literal, and then Damien, like, the word I was looking for is hypnagogic like, and hypnocamping, and, like, oh, yeah, like, these sounds that are, like, in your head but aren't really happening, and so we, you know, we continue that kind of thing on, where it's, like, I, like, to plant the question, it's always pulling you to the next thing, like, what is that coming from? Like, what is that, you know? And you're, like, the character finding, oh, that's the shotgun. Oh, that's, like, you know... You know, like there's this moment, you know, where we're talking about relationships, and so Lara is sexually frustrated, and then over her sexually frustrated face, we hear the sound of lovemaking, and it's like, wait, what's going on? And then we cut to a horror house in Vienna, you know, so it's like, you know, but it's like this great narratively way to juxtapose sexual frustration with sexual gratification. And that was just something that happened in the mix. Yeah. Like, Dee just came up with that in the mix, and we're like, oh, wow, great idea. Let's see if we can, you know, and then Tony jumps on his machine and, and flies his stuff in. And, and makes it work and so that's part of the beauty and the fun of the mix is that you planned everything and you prepared uh, all these tracks and all this music and and yet there's still uh this dynamic creative process yeah. by the director that you know you've got to be prepared for 
like you plant all you plant all this stuff, and then you get to the mix with D, and then you throw it all away. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, but I do, I do credit her with opening me up, opening me up. And, you know, you get very used to work uh, as a dialogue editor for many years. My task has always been to make the dialogue very crystal clear and clean, and the transitions very smooth. And uh, you know, I credit D with uh, with teaching me to keep an open mind and thinking about making the dialogue, letting it be a little dirtier, and um, like the transition with One Morning Soon, uh, cutting it right off into the into the music was something that I, you know, was kind of unorthodox for for us, but it was uh, it was it was eye opening, and, and you it's were and you were right. She's like, <laughs> no, no, it, you, and you were right, you know, and more, you know, first. You know, sometimes you'll make a suggestion, and I'm like, I don't know, that sounds... Uh, <laughs> but then we'll do it. Um, really? You want to do it like that? <laughs> and then we'll do it, and then, and then, yeah. she, and then it'll end up being, th that's the right choice. Like, yeah, the, and like, you, guys, you guys are like, well, uh, it's your movie, yeah. okay. We learned, yeah. we learned, right? we learned on, on Bessie. We learned. We learned. Yeah. We, learned. Yeah. we learned on Bessie, when you have that feeling, like, oh, man, I don't know, D. Yeah. That's the moment you have to sit back and go, trust. Yeah. There's a lot of trust. There was a great yeah. trust her instincts because you know it's going to be interesting. And I want to say also that another idea that came up very quick in the mix oh, yeah. was that there would be you would hear D said we should hear the other voices in the. You, we didn't show you this clip, but in, in the, you know there was a, 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 a fighter a, a bomber sequence, and you hear and one by one, spoiler alert. You know, the other guys in the plane are getting taken out, and D's like I want to hear their voices. I want to hear them go out until we feel that he's alone. And so she and Tony ran upstairs, and now Tony is a superstar in this film. You'll, the you'll, when you watch it, you'll hear Tony. Um, and the other thing that Tony did that I want to point out, which is amazing, this is why you have to hire a really good crew uh, to survive this kind of filmmaking, and I had absolutely the best crew you could have, is that the last scene of the film, he has Ronzel, uh, he, he asked Ronzel to make some utterances when he couldn't speak, and you know, it's it's a killer. And it's, so, that was and it turned out really well. And uh, yeah, I guess so. The, when we originally saw the film, it didn't have those vocalizations in it. And when I was sitting on the stage the first time, I, I heard it actually just brought me to tears because it was so yeah. powerful. It's I, I just wanted I want to add that the other voice of the, of the other crew member oh, yeah. is D. Is D. So <laughs> the two of us. It's a tail gunner. <laughs> No, you were also you were a K K K member and Bessie. K K member yeah. Bessie. That's really yeah. scary. That's like, really scary. I was like, who, who you try that? you try you tried to voice a five year old German boy. Yeah. When, when I was when I was on the stage with you, yeah. you said maybe yeah. maybe I can't get away yeah. with that one. Yeah, yeah. that was Bessie, a bridge too far. So I can't get away with that. I I I was children in the opening of Bessie. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And yeah. You were in this, you also hummed. Yeah. You also hummed for Flo a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Else All hands on deck. Yeah. Reverse the tile. <laughs> and the one thing, can I just, one thing, we, there was no temp mixing on this, so we were all in the deep end of the swimming pool together. <laughs> putting all of these final elements together, this is the only time that we were putting all these, it was literally like watching this thing stand up on legs and walk. It was so thrilling, and I think part of what comes across from the screen is that. And that's part of the reason why it's, it, for me, feels so organic. Yeah. Because it's, you know. Yeah, it's perfect. It's authentic, like life. That's great. Well, why don't we open it up to some questions? We've got about, I think about 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, in the... <clears throat> well, I'm really excited to see the movie. I haven't got a chance to see it yet. Now, my question was for you, Dee, and that is, just from a, I guess from a leadership standpoint, did you feel like success with this music was about, like in the context of what you said about trust, was it about finding the right people or about kind of ha your vision for what you wanted to implement? Do you, you get what I'm saying? Because it sounds like trust is a really big component in putting this music together and handing it off to somebody else. But also, like, you had a clear vision for what you wanted. Like, how, do you, how did you kind of ba balance that a little bit? It's kind of both. It's like sensibility and like rapport. And so I knew tomorrow I had the sensibility. Like I tend to go dark, you know, like give me the sour, give me like the minor notes, you know, like Tamar has that sensibility. So it's like, I know, like I can just turn it over to her and she's going to find the thing. And I think like just trying to keep it like village of artists and like 
you know, give everybody like the first pass, like let everybody take their first pass at it. And then like you jump in, like I try not to be too um, executional up front because then I think that shuts people down or shuts you down creatively because you're not, because they'll come up with something that I, I never would have thought of or even said, but it's, oh, this is great. But if I'd been executional, then they wouldn't have done it because, oh, you don't want this. But like, just try to like find people with the same like sensibility and like vibe. And so, yeah, and like, you know, Damien with the whole like non literal thing, we're all about putting sounds on the screen that aren't motivated by anything happening. And, um, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, right here. First of all, I still have my uh, my Sony DAC recorder, so if you ever see the film, and it was, the sound was subscribed. So I have some questions about the recording. You mentioned you did analog, and you, you saw that, then, that you didn't get a lot of separation. So the studio that you picked, because of the ambience, the strings? Um, I have a thing around recording to tape and flying it into digital. It's just something that I prefer. I like the warmth of the sound. Um, so that was my first priority. And then, you know, my partner and my co-producer who I picked, that's his world. He really is in that analog world. He does a lot of stuff with older sounds, soul sounds, dub sounds. And so that was his way of mixing it down afterwards. Like at that point, I was out of the conversation in terms of the analog um, uh, mix that he turned over. But certainly in the in the, the recording process, that was the choice that I make. I just like the warmth of it. Straight to digital somehow loses something and I just... Yeah. And the studio was the studio where you had a relationship. Yeah, so, and, and then indie budget. So. Yeah, yeah. So even though it was a studio where they didn't do a lot of picture, there was no way that I was going to say, oh, we, you know, we can't do that because they don't have a way to play back to picture. We just figured it out. I borrowed a 50 foot HDMI cable and rounded up a couple extra computer monitors, and you know, <laughs> we made it happen. We made it happen. Yeah. Um, so I'm still like reeling from the movie this morning. I have 5,000 questions about um, One thing I, the score was just not what I was expecting. I don't know what I was expecting, but I loved it. Um, there's something like nostalgic about it, but also super modern. Um, not obviously because I'm really good voice. voice. Um, I just want to know like what the musical influences are. Like, I kind of feel like there's still glass in there, just with like the weird minimalist thing going on. Um, but maybe that's just because I love those glass, so I like kind of But I, yeah, just like as a music nerd, that's, I'm trying to like find how to get that in. So did everybody hear that? She was asking about influences on the score. Yeah. So, well, as, as a composer, as a musician, my, my background is 13 years of Catholic school, so choral classical. So I came through classical through a religious life, but also as a result of that, punk rock and hardcore as an escape. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so when you mesh those two things together, there's a lot of common ground, um, you know, learning resistance and pushing back. Um, and also, when I think about some of the new wave stuff for OMD and Depeche, so all of those things are in there, and I was like, you know, it's like prego, it's in there, and then it comes out. But and also having a range like when we were talking about country violence, and and I was saying like it was at first it was like a deconstructed militaristic uh, drum beat, but voiced through viol through strings, and then it was like, oh, it's a tango, it's a dance, you know. So all of those things come into play. Like I'm a synthesis of every sound I've ever heard. And when I'm scoring, my my method is to, it's, I'd say it's like divination. I'm trying to, um, you know, intuit, like perceive what, what I'm being told from the images, from the dialogue. And then so all of those influences come through and I'm glad that you could hear them, it's cool. <laughs> I wish we had your music here so we just like like play Pearl oh. and so they could hear you like banging out on like fucking guitar like yeah. like it's total. Yeah. I hope you guys release a soundtrack. Please do. Yeah. I listen to it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, yeah. Alright, how's it going? Um, I'm a you know uh, sound designer, composer. Uh, I make my own films. I probably at some point play all of your roles at once to do my work. And something that I've gotten into a lot lately is. Uh, kind of documentary filmmaking around uh, music and, and music communities, and especially music communities that might not necessarily have um, of my perspective uh, in it. But what I'm kind of curious about, and, and you guys talked about this earlier, is kind of the rawness and the dirtiness of the sound. And I find that I, I it's so much more natural and, and it reflects the actual experience because it's you're there and you have the mic to capture this unique 
moment. So I was kind of curious if you guys could talk a little bit about how you feel about that type of sound design and how it kind of reveals certain truths about what you're trying to make and then that context in the greater uh, filmmaking world and where you see the future of that type of sound design. I mean, I like, I mean, so like sound, as with picture, to me, when something is too presentational, you know, it gets corny, you know, everything, you can see everything clearly. So I always like, you know, just with the camera, I'm always trying to like dirty the foreground and like, you know, keep things like people aren't facing each other when they're talking to each other and like make it non-presentational. I think the sound, I like it not presentational. I'm not like presenting to you with a woman fanning the fan, the guy, you know, men walking across the room, we gotta hear clock, 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 you know? So I like, you know, I, I obviously embrace dirty sound. Like I do, like I've seen like, you know, Cinematography is kind of dirty, you know, moving pictures. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to allow for accidents and then embrace them when they're good accidents. You know, and that's part of the rawness that we're talking about. And I think you feel it in the music because there are relatively fewer players, so you really feel the instruments, I think, in a, you know, in, in an exposed way, which I, I was loved, because that wasn't in the temp. I mean, the temp was you know, probably from a, you know, a MIDI temp or whatever, and, and so once we got the score, then I could hear the musicians, and sometimes, you know, that would be, people would see that as kind of, a, you know, a negative, but in this instance, I, I really feel the bows on the strings, you know, and that, that was, Pretty awesome, and then, but there's, you know, as far as the sound design, I think there's a lot more choices. There, it's all about choices, you know. Um, what do we want to hear? How much do we want to hear? What do we? What? How can I help the actors' physical performance? Because when they're recording on set, they are capturing the voice, or they're trying to capture the voice. Often in really tough situations, sometimes not doing it so well because of the noise or whatever. But they're not capturing, generally, a lot of times, the physical performance of the actors. So that's something that we try to, to, to bring back to the performances, usually through Foley, out of an amazing Foley team, um, JPEG Foley artist, and uh, William Sweeney, who's my Foley ed editor, both really like artists and um, super pros. And they kind of, they bring all that sound, and then I choose what from amongst what they brought that I feel like will help the story in each scene um, and point you to the things that the characters are doing. And everything should have its own character, whether it's a, you know, a footstep could be um, purposeful or drunken, shuffling, you know, a, a, a door slam or a door open could be, you know, furtive or, or violent. And so when we do sound design, we just every, you know, we want every sound to be well chosen and, and, um, and have a character of its own and, and, and fit the story, fit the, the scene, and, and add to it in some way. Um, that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, I guess to follow it up really quick, just like when well, you talked a lot about how you used a lot of the stuff that was on location in voiceovers. So, what made you decide to use those takes over? Um, that was really pure D, you know, she D just loved what she had, I would say, you know. It's just like the, the, the vocal performance. There's two performances here. There's like, you know, when they're relating to each other and then the voiceover. And I view the voiceover itself as a performance and like where they hold, where they lilt, or, you know, and, you know. I wanted to record it on set because they're in costume, they're in the room, and so you get the room tone of that room with the voiceover. And so the tone shifts. And like, for example, like when Laura is kind of describing how she met her husband, like, you know, we, we recorded the first part of her voiceover in this like pristine, like kind of like, you know, Memphis house set. And then we recorded part of her voiceover like in the park. And so like that was one shift that didn't quite work because it's like such a huge shift in tone from like inside to outside. But we tried to preserve as much as possible. So it just places the character in the world. And I think the danger with voiceover is sometimes it can become less emotional because it's disembodied from the character. And I didn't, didn't want that to happen. I didn't want this to be a voiceover move where you don't feel anything. So to try to keep the voice connected to the character, you know, keeping the tone of the room, I think helped and when they're in costume and, you know, they're, you know, it's just a different performance. It's, a, it's just a better performance versus coming to New York, standing in a studio with all the staring at you, you know, <laughs> and there's a, you know. It, there's, there's no question about it because we did, we did at, at, on some cases try to replace what we thought the track was a little bit dirty say it wasn't it wasn't wasn't great so we did uh, re-record them in a studio in New York and the comparison was 
it was you know it was no comparison. We had to go back to the original and just clean it up a, a little bit without affecting the you know tonality and the, you know, the, the, the lyricism of the performances, uh, which, which were really very effective. And it ended up being one of the themes of the mix. Because I think every piece of the uh, of voiceover feels like the character is at that moment speaking to the audience from yeah. where they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's really it's a very powerful choice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, first of all, kudos to the entire team. Just amazing, amazing soundtrack. Also, uh, D, I wanted to. I've, I've been a composer for over 30 years. You sound like a dream director to work with. <laughs> Not tomorrow, we, we confirm that, but he seems absolutely wonderful. The question I have has more to do with the Dolby Atmos. Um, so when all this happened and the relationship was created to, to go that way, did you then have to go to another dub to a dub, another dub stage that was installed and set up and calibrated with Dolby Atmos, or did you have that installed where you were? Well, you we were we were fortunate in that um, these guys work at Harbor Stu uh, Harbor Studios in, in New York, and you yeah. guys have an Atmos stage. Um, I think you you did start on a seven point one stage, though, didn't you? Yeah, we we started in seven one, okay. and, and we started planning for Atmos Just, from the beginning. You kind of did a pre premix. Yeah, we started yeah. premixing. Well, what was uh, partially what was interesting about the process was that you know even though you know you we jumped on board and you know you guys had the grant before you started, but your Atmos stage wasn't available until January. So they oh, but, started. But they knew they were going to go. You knew yeah. they were going to go out. Yeah. So okay. they started mixing in seven point one, but always keeping it in mind. But uh, the other thing is, was you guys did a couple of weeks and then you stopped, and you went away for the holidays and you mm -hmm. came back. And I think that actually had a really good effect on the film, too. You kind of well, set the set on my nerves. Perspective on it, yeah. A little perspective. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah, right here. First of all, thank you all for your work. It's really, I think, masterful and amazing. My question is. I keep hearing the limitations that were present, not only with the time, but with some of the facilities, and the good limitations or not. Without those limitations, how do you think, how do you think the lifting of those limitations would have affected the ultimate product? Well, I'll give you a really good example. We, <laughs> so we spent uh, the first uh, couple of weeks in the mix, mixing in 7-1 and planning to do this Atmos mix at the end and, and really to final in Atmos. So we went to the Atmos stage and we realized, because it was the first time we all mixed in Atmos, the scope of what was ahead of us. And then we divided, we decided to divide the mix into th tiers. And we said, okay, we're going to attack all the tier one scenes that we want to do. So these are all the big war scenes and every music cue. We want every music cue to give it the Atmos treatment you know, in the room. And, and because we figure that that is a very constant thing throughout the movie and it should be consistent. So then we had tier two was going to be the quieter scenes that, you know, this amazing, um, you've seen the film, I guess, yeah, uh, these amazing landscapes that we wanted to give it that same 3D space into. We never got to tier two. <laughs> so, uh, so if we had, if the limitations were lifted, that would be probably the first thing we get to, you know, like at the end of year one when Hap is giving the whole voiceover about deeds, and he's looking at these amazing landscapes. We would have spent a lot more time treating that. Seven grand. Yeah. <laughs> um, from the recording perspective, the post would have been a way different situation. We definitely had to like just in terms of the score. It, well, yeah, the recording of the score. Um, uh, yeah, because definitely had to like. I don't know, pull things out of the air at the end just to kind of fill in. Yeah, some things that, yeah, that definitely would have been. I think an extra day. Yeah. At two, would be a, <laughs> two would have been a luxury, an extra day would have been perfect. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of limitations, like I kept saying, there's no isolation. You know, you know what? That was in some ways, we made that work for us in a really, I think, important way because recording it the way we recorded it gave it a particular sound and i think that i think that that i think that is translated i think it was in line yeah with what d requested because right. there was a whole lot of isolation and it sounded too pristine it, she really wanted muscular emotional dark yeah. roughness going I, I, got, I, gotta say, strings. I gotta say when you're sitting in the echoes last night with that crowd watching that film i wasn't really thinking about the limitations it, it played it played really well i mean we you know yeah. part part of it as a filmmaker part of it is 
is like Rob laid out this thing of a, a great example of how you make your priorities, and then you take what you have and you make it work for you. Like the, you know, like, but it's interesting because you say limitations, right? But at the same time, when it's it's it, it makes you break out of whatever you're yeah. used to, and then you end up tapping into and reaching into something else that you didn't even know you had because you had to be creative in this whole other way, right? Yeah, and you you talked very early on in the process about how you were sort of, you didn't mind the fact that you had budgetary restrictions, that you were gonna limit yourself to a very small ensemble. You know, very quickly we learned that we were not gonna be using piano. <laughs> and you, yeah, and you felt that that, you know, that gave you the palette that you knew you so you spent all of your creative energy instead of figuring out how to make this you knew exactly the tools that you had and you just used all your creative energy to use those tools in a really interesting and inventive way and we and we um Dolby recorded some behind the scenes of these amazing musicians and i think we're going to put it up on their website cause it's yeah like, so to behold, it's yeah we we we, we we shot some video at the recording sessions and we're going to put together a little behind the scenes piece and when the film comes out uh, we'll put all that up, and, and it'll, it'll, it'll be a resource. Up. So we've got one more question? Time for one more? Yeah, right here. So time and budget restrictions aside, um, the, we talked about the beginning of the process and how um, you ask the artist to kind of spot the film and then let the sound design and music play through. And I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit about the creative process that you go through towards the end of the project? How do you know when to kind of put your, your artistic tools down and step back? How do you know when you're done? I was gonna say, I think like if you think about it too long, like, you start like messing stuff up. I think we just hit the point where I was about to start doing crazy shit. So it's like <laughs> the time is good. It's like you know what? It's good we're out of time because now I'm starting to like, you know, we're at the point of diminishing returns where like the next thing you add is actually taking away from it. So you don't know. And honestly, like the more I watch it and listen to it, the less I like it. Yep. And so I get jaded. I don't know. I get like the last time I screened it, I was like, I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm feeling meh. You know what I mean? So it's like. When I'm feeling mad, it's time to stop because then I, I just actually don't like the film anymore, and I'm, I know I'm, I've lost perspective completely. You know, so yeah. It was actually there was a really powerful, it was an interesting moment. I don't know if that's what you were talking about, but uh, at that last playback, and you're like, you had a whole bunch of notes, and then you actually just kind of put it down. And you were like, I'm done. Yeah. And it's like yeah. Let, yeah. let's 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 move on. Yeah, just like one more hour is just gonna open up things and not. So it's just kind of like be deliberate and just have what you have. And yeah, it's like it's like it's like a weird emotional thing. I mean, it's like postpartum depression. I don't know, but it's like this moment where it's like uh, I don't know. So yeah. Uh, well, that's all the time that we have uh, for the panel. D, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. <laughs> Rob, Damien. Thank you so much. And thanks for coming out to talk with us about the media.